That's a weird experience, isn't it? I know you've got a whole lot more credits like than you, me. I know. It's like <laughs> embarrassing. Good morning, everybody. We're happy to see you all here today after so, so many delays. So uh, hopefully you'll enjoy yourselves as well. Absolutely. Um, Dave and I have known each other for a very long time, so I will try my best to get us out of the 80s. And, um, <laughs> but I da- can't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but Dave Faulkner, uh, as we know, one of, one of Australia's most prolific and revered singer-songwriters, um, singer and principal songwriter with the Gurus, um, started his career as Dave Flick in the heady days of punk and early swampy grun- grunge in Perth in the late 70s. And I will talk about that because it was such a formative time. Uh, inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame in 2007. The new album, the 10th studio album, Chariots of the Gods, is released earlier this year. 12 years in the making, Dave. Obviously (laughs) didn't want to rush this one. Um, What's been the approach to writing and recording this time around? Uh, Well, first I'll explain it wasn't... 12 years making this one album, it's just been a lot of wasting time uh, and then when we sat down to make the album, uh, it was just before COVID hit, uh, in the end of 2019, we did a single and it was really um, t- testing the waters because, because the band has a new drummer and uh, I was uh, yeah, just uncertain as to how it would work with someone, you know, we'd hit, we obviously knew we could play our old songs well and we were really bonded that way but to work on new material together of course is a very personal thing and... Uh, as I say, I was just uh, testing the water. So I had this song that I, worked, I pretty much wrote on the way home from rehearsal uh, that, you know, that came up with the, the main riff. And then the next day at rehearsal, we uh, did some work on it. And so um, it just came together quite quickly. And so that was a really great sort of start for the record. And uh, we'd planned a series of singles and I sort of started working on the songs at that time, really. Um, so uh, just to, I guess, given that we're talking about songwriting today, I'll just explain quickly that... Um, I t- generally don't write songs uh, you know, like regularly. Um, I'm always coming up with little ideas and little melodies or maybe occasionally lyrics, but usually it's melodies. And uh, I kind of I store them on my phone. And um, when it comes time to do a record, I will go back to those as like a work tape and just pick out things that still excite me and uh, turn those into songs. So basically they're all brand new songs, but some of them have been like 10 years, maybe longer uh, since I first came up with the original idea. Because I did um, have a listen to a, a couple of things that you've been saying about the approach to this record that was that was very much about a kind of a singles-based approach, which was sort of harking back to the Stone Age Romeos. I see we get we Our got there straight away. The 80s. We got there straight away, <laughs> straight back to the eighties. But as, as an approach to constructing a record and and a, and a series of of songs that would come together. That's right. It's interesting. So talk us through that that idea that each song in its own right is is kind of a standalone single. Yeah. Well, yeah. A, there was a couple of reasons for that for that idea I had. Um, firstly, because as I say, uh, a new drummer. I'm trying to work on songs and see where we're going to and establish a, a whole new relationship that way creatively so that was one of the reasons we did it you know track by track in a way rather than just go into a studio and commit to doing a whole album of, of songs and saying you know that's what we got um and secondly because i was still writing the songs and uh, you know and that was going to be also influenced by the the working relationship we had because as much as you're the writer and you dict- dictate the songs and the music that the band plays or whatever your group you know situation you're in whether it's, you know, just a casual collection of artists, musicians to make a record or even one you're doing by yourself. Um, you know, you can discover your direction as you go rather than pre or predetermine it. So, I um, mean, yeah, that's kind of, you know, a fairly, uh, you know, uh, creative thing to do. So that was one reason. The second reason, of course, is um, because of the modern way of things in the case of, um, you know, the way the industry has changed with streaming being the major way that people consume music, um, a little known fact is that the, you know, the basically streaming uh, platforms are the new radio stations, you know, or there's certainly a whole extra way of promoting yourselves and being heard and discovered by people. And they have their own sort of policy about um, material that's released in that once it's actually released digitally, they won't um, promote it later as on a, on a playlist. They just promote things that are actually new. So in the old days, you'd release, like before streaming, you'd release an album and then you might release singles afterwards as a, to keep the album in the charts and to keep people excited and to maybe some people had heard one song or two and might not have committed to buying the record and they heard a third song that they really liked and they might buy the record for that reason. So that was the way it used to work. 
But nowadays, it's all front-loaded. And uh, you release the songs before the album comes out. And as soon as the album is released, the streaming companies weren't basically uh, playing more tracks. They say it's already available, so I will we feature a song. So we kind of accepted that as being a, a, a reason to do it a different way. And, uh, and also, as you say, it reminded me of when we did our very first album, because in those days, I mean, the band was unknown. We'd been signed up very, very small label, and people pretty much uh, thought it was quite funny that this kind of guitar band was being signed up in the days of, uh, you know, synth pop and, you know, Human League and the Thompson Twins and all those things back in the, the mid-'80s. So um, we had to get ourselves well-known, and that way we'd release a single, do a bit of touring, release another single, do more touring, and then, you know, it's eventually we made the final parts of the album. So that was how that was done. And we kind of echoed that in a, for a different reason this time. I want to... Because you've also resurrected Big Time Records to release this record. <laughs> yes, that's the first uh, label that signed us up, who we sued yeah. way back in yes, the mid-'80s. Yes, you now own. We now own, yes. yes. very uh, nice. <laughs> yes, I can, tell, I can tell you some war stories about, uh, you know, the, the rapacious business and how you can be ripped off and all those things. And and uh, we've had all of those things happen to us. Um, we, we are one of these few... Um, uh, legal cases that have ever been carried through to a judgment in Australia for music. Um, the other one, I believe, is the Air Supply. There may have been more since then, um, but those were two quite significant ones. Not a lot of people settle eventually and doesn't go to to a, become a judgment, but ours was actually went right to the bitter end. We paid the barristers and cost a lot of money and a lot of time, but we got our freedom and. Uh, Eventually, we ended up buying the shell of the company because there was no assets left in it. The uh, owner had made had run it down to zero, um, taken things offshore or whatever. So um, there was nothing left other than the name of the company and all the copyrights that were ours and other artists as well. And we, we ended up buying them from the liquidator and we ended up owning Big Time Records. And of course, when we had a, our new deal with Universal, um, we have our own label, which we decided to call Big time records, <laughs> just to kind of like, you know, use that for a bit of a laugh. Yes, a delicious vindication. Um, and, and also about creative control too, ensuring that you, you, you know, can maintain control and talk a little bit more about that. Mm. But, um, okay, let's go back there. Um, <laughs> we, we've ticked off the new record just, to, just so that you're reassured <laughs> that I have actually heard it and <laughs> we do know that you, you're still making great music. Um, so... The genesis for you as a songwriter uh, was was that formative stage, late seventies in in Perth, the victims. Um, yes, uh, swamp. The scientists were around at the time. Who scientists came out afterwards. Yeah. Uh, that was because James joined the scientists from That's after right. the victims. James Baker, our, our, our drummer, drums. and he's also on the Hoodoo Guru's first album. He was. Um, Talk us through your own, I guess, formative years as a songwriter. You know, coming into your own, who were you listening to? What was influencing you? What, what, what were you actually trying to do as a, as a creative at that time? Sure. Well, I'm, an, I'm quite an old person. I'm 65 this year. So I was born in Not the so old. late 50s. And um, I had the good fortune to be a child when the Beatles were around. So that was a group that really influenced me as a kid. Um, my brother's eight years older than I am and... Uh, he didn't like school very much, so he ended up getting an apprenticeship. And uh, so quite early, he started getting some income and he brought home those cool singles, The Stones and, you know, Manfred Mann and The Easy Beats and, of course, Beatles. Uh, and the first couple of albums I remember really connecting to was the second Beatles album, With The Beatles, and uh, later on, uh, Revolver. Those two records are indelibly stamped on my, on my uh, consciousness. I can almost, you know, hear them without, you know, from, from beginning to end, just in my mind. But um, obviously so many other different things of music as well. Um, uh, you know, music of your parents, that, you know, quite different. My father hated rock and roll and my mother liked classical as well as, you know, the pop music she grew up with, which was Nelson Eddy. But, um, yeah, for me, um, music was just something that was in me. Um, I, I never planned to be a musician or a songwriter. I just, um, I, I actually was quite good at uh, visual arts. I was a p bit of a painter and a drawer as a kid and that was something at school people thought I was moving towards and they kind of indulged me a little bit and didn't go too hard on me as far as, you know, you know doing my homework and all those things. Um, and music was just something I, I, was, I just did and was passionate about. And I had a, a, a group in high school that I was in, that um, a rock group, and uh, I wrote a couple of songs. I even had a dream, you know, like a fantasy about writing a rock opera at the time. You know, of course, it was all the rage. Um, but... Uh, you know, as I say, music was just something I was doing. And it wasn't until I went to university and um, I failed architecture because I'd been encouraged to do something more, uh, you know, 
responsible with my visual skills, you know, rather than just try to be an artist, um, which many people that do music would understand um, that, that, that sort of pressure from people to uh, not think you can uh, make Get money out of this, this fly-by-night career, yeah. which is, is definitely true, but, um, you know, you still... Um, so I, I failed architecture because I just you know, really didn't really um, respond to that, you know, more, uh, yeah, solid way of doing things and and the reason I wasn't passing architecture was because I was um, playing music the whole time and and I didn't go to lectures and that was when I suddenly realized that in fact I was a musician and and uh, I just started to go with that but it was kind of a you know as I said I'd always done it I wrote my first song as a little kid probably about the age of 10 I think I don't know for sure but I was on the way back from the shop uh, getting my mother some smokes and, um, you know, I just started singing a song and, you know, making up melodies and uh, melody and, and writing some words about the uh, family dog that was with me. Um, so, it was, as I always like to say, it was a love song, my first song. Yeah, well, I think there was <laughs> another one too that came a bit later. <laughs> yes. No, that wasn't about a dog, even though people think so. The video was. Uh, he's talking about my girl there. Uh. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, as I say, music was just something that was in me. And, and you know, my, my mother and my sister love to sing as well and I and I was a sort of elected harmony guy so I'd sing all the all the, 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 the uh, alto part or whatever you want to call it the, the harmony which kind of was a good way of discovering you know the structure of the chords underneath the songs you know when you, you the melody is one thing but to know what the correct harmony note is shows you what you understand the chord structure and and those sorts of things so I guess I had either I had an innate sense of that or I learned it from doing that mm. but I taught myself I did do some music lessons uh learned violin for a year or t two years and was d just didn't like it because it wasn't like the Beatles you know I was playing this horrible music that they made you do is you know scales and things not scales so much but other things so I gave that up and I was jealous of my sister who played piano because she'd be at a party and there'd be a piano in the corner and she could entertain people whereas no one wanted to hear me on the violin <laughs> especially the way I was playing it <laughs> so uh, I decided to get learn piano for a year and uh uh, then I gave that up because I was too lazy and also the same problem, you know, that I didn't want to play Shortland Bread over and over. So, um, oh, I don't know, it's not so, so bad. I, so <laughs> I about a year, I gave up for a year, pretty much, didn't touch the piano and then I started teaching myself. And I, I taught myself um, like a, a guitar way, in a sense. I, I um, picked out chords and just sang along with them and played Beatles songs, you know. Um, I think uh, George Harrison's All Things Must Pass was out at that time and I remember playing uh, songs from his album. Um, and I did everything in the key of uh, G sharp, which I, any keyboard players would know. That's um, one of the black notes in the middle of the three black notes. There's three black notes, two black notes, three. That's that pattern on a keyboard. Because I couldn't make head or tail of all the white notes. There's too many. Right. So, so I just picked the one in the middle of the two other black ones and I'd start every song in that key. There is the insight <laughs> to the genius. <laughs> The Black Keys. <laughs> the Black Keys. <laughs> and not the other band. Um, you talked, I, I wanted to, you know, I'd sort of been interested to talk to you about the very strong visual narrative of the gurus from a very early stage and that you've explained it, that you were fascinated with design and architecture and because right from the start there, there was a very strong visual language of what the guru, Huda gurus were. You know, there was obviously... When we had hair, it was big. <laughs> <laughs> I had every sort of hair you can have. There was big hair, and, and there were paisley shirts, and there, but and there was the you know the um, the kind of pop culture, sort of the dinosaur look, and and you know the kind sure. of um, you know the women, you know all those sorts of images that you'd grabbed from very Americana kinds of things. But it was a strong visual image for, for the band right from the start, very clearly defined. Yeah. yeah. Well, 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 actually, you know, obviously, we had worked with some fantastic other, you know, visual artists, real artists, you know, who, who obviously uh, interpreted our ideas or, ga you know, gave us their benefits of their great creativity. But um, I put that down to partly, as you say, you know, my background in visual arts um, and a love of trash culture, which was something I pretty much, uh, you know, again, you know, being from the 60s, you know, I remember uh, Australia, colour television only came in in 1975 in Australia. So we had this strange thing where, up to that point, um, it was all black and white TV. So the networks were showing all these really ancient sitcoms from the 50s and, you know, that were black and white that, you know, had been long vanished off the screens overseas but were current in Australia in a sense, you know. So we had this diet of constant uh, sitcoms and I just, as a, I used to consume them, you know, terribly. Um, 
uh, and there was a way of actually uh, watching a sitcom from about the 3 p.m. till about 7.30 at night without seeing any news or anything. There was, they, for some reason, that, at mm. the, those days, the news was staggered half an hour apart on the different major networks. Mm. So you could actually sort of channel switch and uh, see a sitcom instead. So um, that, I just, for some reason, loved all that stuff. And I, I obviously got the idea that that was considered to be lowbrow and, you know, that sort of, mm. you know, rubbish TV was, uh, you know, beneath contempt. And, um, you know, when punk rock came along, um, we kind of celebrated things like that kind of naivete and that, and that um, uh, that sort of smart, dumb stuff. You know, the Ramones are one of my favourite bands. Mm. Um, that was a pivotal moment in my life, uh, hearing the Ramones album, you know, along with the Beatles. Uh, next, really, there was glam rock, hard rock, you know, um, Deep Purple and things like that. But mm. punk rock was really the crucible that shaped me as an artist, mm. um, which I'm happy to go into. But that was part of the, the Ramones was that, that clever, stupid thing, you know, the, the, you know, these 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 punks that were, you know, basically, you know, street kids that, you know, got lucky in a way, but they wrote these songs that were kind of smart and and uh, quite, you know, yeah. So I, we liked that whole sensibility, and that was, of course, you know, translated also into the visuals. So you know, and dinosaurs. Everyone loves a dinosaur. So we, you know, we adopted, you know, and we loved the Three Stooges and uh, whatever, all these different things, and and that's pretty much been a constant for us. Um, it, Sometimes to our cost, because um, you know our videos, for example, were often very you know ridiculous. Uh, we made we we weren't very serious, and we we kind of didn't go the highbrow way of presenting ourselves, and you know, or, or super glamorous, and and you know, and making ourselves appear to be you know gods. We kind of punctured the, the mythology all the time and made ourselves look stupid and ridiculous which, of course, people tend to treat you that way as well. So <laughs> we're taken seriously. But um, it's just been a part of who we are and, 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 and rock and roll as well. You know, it's, it's a bit of a dress-up business, isn't it? Let's be honest, you know. You, you try to present and make people, you know, feel like they're seeing something and, you know, that, that, that's a bit special. So you try to kind of, you know, put on a show and dressing up and, you know, looking different to everyone else is part of that. You know, it's, a punk rock was very much that was part of being a punk rocker you know everyone was a, was a star because mm. there were no stars so but everyone wanted to look different to the people around them and you know the, the world the, the the uncaring you know mediocre world that we were trying to rebel against so that again that's all part of the same thing yeah and and i guess there was an expectation that you know you go see the gurus and there'll be great songs great shirts and great hair <laughs> but okay. um but how much of, of, you know, you were able to hone your skills at a time where you could literally play eight nights a week? True. Um, play several shows. <laughs> literally. You know, like, you, you know, wow. I mean, well, you know, that eight was... Eight days a week, the Beatles. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, that, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, yeah. you could, you could, you know, you could see four or five bands a night at four or five different venues and honing your skills as a performer as a songwriter being able to see how a song would land in that environment in that very kind of visceral immediate um environment how much did that assist you i guess in those formative stages of your career both as a performer as a song and as a songwriter well i'll I'll put it in three steps um firstly uh high school i mentioned having a band there that's where i pretty much developed my skills as a performer i mean I never uh, thought of it from an external point of view of like what do I look like and how do I perform and what should I do, but I definitely got the feeling of being comfortable on stage and and people didn't complain, so I knew that I was doing something right. Um, I wasn't the main guy in the band, by the way, but you know it's just something I you know I just you know I just felt at home, and I think that shows to people when they come to see you that you're confident and you know someone that that is worthy of consideration or whatever can pay attention to um as whoop <laughs> puff uh, that's a cue for something isn't it don't pay attention to that man power um, blackout <laughs> then uh secondly um the punk rock thing of course you know that was when my songwriting uh, became front and center um mm. where i was able to um you know write a whole lot of songs you know because it was all about um making art for yourselves and there was no plan of success because we knew that no one else in the world would like this music and I was in Perth where I grew up and uh, you know that was like the furthest place from anywhere I Mm. mean it's I think it's the most remote city on earth as far as certainly in the western world Mm. Um, you know we're closer to Bali than we are to uh, the east coast of Australia 
and there's a huge desert in between. It was like insurmountable uh, sort of barrier to us. But, um, you know, just writing songs and playing them and, you know, that was uh, mm. very much where I became uh, much more confident as a songwriter. Again, there was no pressure. It was just purely to do it to amuse ourselves and, you know, we just we didn't care who, what anyone else thought. We were just doing it to, to our own fun. Um, and then finally, as you say, that the whole thing of playing all those gigs when the band was starting, you know, that was that the halcyon day, as everyone talks about, of the pub rock scene of the 80s in Australia, and which is a bit of a misnomer, you know, pub rock. There is no such thing. You know, everyone played in the pubs. Were they all pub rockers? You know, some people get called pub rock and others get told they get played they played in pubs. You know, the go-betweens played in pubs, you know, Triffords. They weren't pub rock, but nor would, you know, in excess, what were they? The stadium rock? Well, they played in pubs. You know, like, they, they, everyone was playing music, but what it was was an incredible opportunity to play a lot of uh, performances because, um, again, to sort of harken back to the way the world has changed, there, was no, uh, there were no apps. There were no dating apps. So in those days, if you wanted to meet someone on a Tuesday night... You'd go to the Hopeton. You'd go to the hotel and you want to go see... If you want to meet the right sort of person that was into the sort of things you liked... Well, that band represents the sort of things I respond to. They're kind of intelligent or they're funny or they're outrageous or they're hard rocking and, you know, sweaty. Whatever it is that you're particularly into as a person, if you want someone like that, go see that band. You might meet someone that you like. Mm. And that's what would happen. And so that people were going out a lot and just to, um, to meet people. And also, you know, we didn't have the expenses of internet and mobile phones and all those things as well. So um, that's what it went to. And uh, music was the beneficiary of all that uh, extra, you know, nightclub life it was also a period too where um and and the evolution of radio in in your career in terms of early support of the band you know the when the sydney version of triple j and community radio and 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 championing those you know incredible radio friendly hits that you write was also just a really incredibly beneficial part for you to sort of build that audience. It and was. Um, finding your audience. So for us, to be honest, it seriously was, um, we were pretty much door-to-door salesmen mm-hmm. because we sometimes, like, for example, Triple J, they were Triple J at that stage, um, they, you know, would lionise us, but then other times they would completely, you know, steer clear of us. And it was very... Not when we, I was there. <laughs> well, I, it felt like it. You know, we waxed and waned. And same with commercial radio, you know, we had hits quite early on in our career, but sometimes they would, you know, they would... It seemed to be they'd always play the, the songs from the previous album because they don't like to play new music. And that's still the case, by the way. I mean, even more so, sadly. Um, but, you know, there was also, let's not forget, there was television shows as well that were very um, important. There was you know, Donnie Sutherland had a three-hour show on a Saturday morning. Sounds. And he also had an evening show later on called After Dark. And we were on those. So it just happened to coincide when we started. And we, yeah. he, for some reason, we managed to use that as a platform. But, um, yeah, there was lots of things going on. Uh, I'm very upset with the way Australian radio has been completely uh, has turned its back on Australian music, and I think mm. that the, I hope the new government will actually enforce the um, quotas. The quotas because it's been flaunted and and made it. They've, they've basically, you know, they've, they've been cheating and lying about it for years. And well, and, and playing heritage, you know, not you know, not not playing new and not play, not championing. Yeah. They don't even play the the correct quota. They yeah. they'll play some stuff midnight to dawn and yeah. then say we're playing Australian music. Uh, it's disgusting, and a lot of it's programmed from America. It's you know, and and it's 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 always been the case. The cultural cringe is alive and well in Australia, uh, in terms of the uh, radio, especially, um, where they feel they're doing you a favour by playing your song. But if they play something from a similar artist to you in another country, it's like, well, of course we'll play them. They're from overseas. They're fabulous. You know, but if you play this, you know, uh, if you happen to have a loud guitar on your track in Australia, they'll say, oh, you can play this music. Is so you're beyond the pale. It was, we'll play Foo Fighters. Interesting. We might live in different worlds because I listen to a lot of community radio and um, I reckon they're still... Oh, community radio's always been yeah. solid behind yeah. Australian music. There's no question of that. Yeah. Um, but, I'm, you know, but I, you know, certainly uh, Triple J yeah. operates as an alternative commercial network in a way these days. I mean, it's, yeah. you, know, no, you know, they do a great job, but they can't do every... They can't pick up the slack for the whole industry and, and, you know, and they also have their own foibles, which you know, unfortunately a lot of music falls between the cracks of that. Yeah. I could talk a lot about the new Triple J or whatever it is now. Anyway, I'm too old school for that now. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to talk to you about what's my scene. Oh, yep. Um, 
you know, probably, I guess, in many ways, the, a, a really breakthrough single for you, a pivotal moment for you as a songwriter in the band. I mean, there'd been songs before. <laughs> well, it was a very successful song. It was I mean, a very successful We were doing pretty well song. before that. I know um, you were, but I... I mean, I, it's funny, there's all this pressure, you know, like you have to have a new single that's going to be as big as the other ones, but we didn't think like that. No. But I'm um, sorry, I, I interrupted you, but... Yeah. No, no, it's all right. Go <laughs> ahead and interrupt me. But no, it was a big song, so you'd had yeah, a big huge. hit. Biggest had song had we've had. had. Yeah, well, there you are, so I, I was right. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no denying. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay, I'll go backwards. So, it was a big song for you, Dave, <laughs> uh, you. What's My Scene. And, of course, you know, um, everyone played it on the radio. and All the radio. Played it on the television. And it was a, a, a really big pivotal moment for you as a songwriter and for the band. Yeah. Um, I want to ask what it meant to you as a songwriter to have mm. a, su- a really successful song like that. What, what was that for you? Apart from the royalties, of course. Thank you, APRA. Uh, by the way, we love APRA. I mean, APRA is uh, basically a non-profit. You know, they, they, they have expenses, you know, to, to uh, run their business. But they are exclusively the only people that represent Australian songwriters in this country. We have, there's various other uh, bodies around the world that do it for different territories. But APRA is the uh, one in Australia. So don't think of it as being like a business, you know, like someone saying, come and join you know, a news corporation or something. This is not like that. Or whatever, you know, Coke, whatever. They're not like that. They're actually, they service... Uh, serve uh, the real, artist, yeah. They service the artist. Yeah. I mean, I just got a royalty statement yesterday from Apra, so thank ah, you. Apra. Drinks are on day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so back to the question. Um, well, as I was just kind of in, uh, slightly inferred, I mean, I was, we were already successful and as, you know, so what's my scene was just more of the same. It was, a, it was obviously an tra- upward trajectory and, and uh, it was, you know, remarkable. Uh, you could feel the, the, um, you know, the fact that it was a hit. And it was our biggest hit. It was top three, I think, or something like that. Um, never got number one. But um, the thing, as I say, with us, it was weird. You know, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, go, I'll talk about what's my scene in one second. But as far as success goes, um, we didn't. Re- we knew we were successful, but we were so busy working. You know, like those things about the seven days a week working and and playing gigs and and all that. And you know, then getting off tour and having to make a record then go back out on tour again. It was just like constant. And you're kind of a little bit, um, you know, not really aware of what the world outside is, is looks like towards you. You know, you're only seeing it from the inside out, which is, um, you know, I'm really kind of exhausted or I'm really kind of losing my marbles and being a little bit of an asshole, a bit arrogant, you know, because, you know, people are all, you know, wanting a piece of you. And so you kind of like get a little bit, you know, sometimes that can be a little bit strange and put you in a different place mentally. Um, but but um, so for for us the success was kind of incremental in a way because it's you know it's from the very beginning of the band it, it sort of just kept going up and up without really any major hiccups I mean we had some internal stuff that was really horrible but but as far as you know the business side of things and su- success you know as a band making ourselves well known it, it just seemed to happen naturally without us knowing mm. how it was happening um, so as far as what's my scene goes though. I do, as a songwriter, that is a song I often um, talk about as being a pivotal one for me or, or more appropriately, I'd say, is a song that, that captures everything I think is best about my songwriting in that it's really memorable. Um, the lyrics are very truthful to things that I feel and still experience and feel. <laughs> um, I'm kind of fairly, uh, you know, always questioning who I am and how I fit in with things and trying to figure that out and, and address it. In, and prove it um, and it's also you know it's just as a pure s- bit of song craft I just am marvel at the fact that it's got so much melody in it and even the beat even the uh, middle eight section is kind of really catchy and kind of anthemic you know it, it's it's all kind of really sort of powerful you know stuff and and I mean I guess in a way how could it fail to be hit you know because it was so you know there's so much in it um, it's really concentrated energy, that song. Um, did you wake up with it? Like, how did that one...? It, 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 like most of my songs, it starts with a little bit of a melodic, uh, you know, noodling on a guitar, you know, whatever, finding a little c- shape. And I, what it was is that simple... I mean, guitarists will understand this, this part now, is the D chord, uh, open D, um, just lifting the one finger off on the, the high E string uh, to the open string, so it's a, you know... Um, what is that note? Uh, it's a, it's a, it becomes a ninth, doesn't it? From a major third to a, a you know, third note to a, to a, a two, to a, you know. Um, and I just, I thought, oh, that sounds good. Da, da, that sounds interesting. And I thought, what if I do the same 
uh, but you know, little note note, little top note thing, but on a different chord. So I transposed to an E chord and did the same thing. I thought, oh, that sounds good too. What would come next? Well, a G chord's in the same kind of sensible key. So I went to a G chord, did the same thing, which made it was like a major seventhy thing to a sixth. Um, and already the song kind of was a, you know, there's the melody of the chorus right there. But it was re literally just a, a process of discovery, just, you know, uh, which I will talk about when we, in the workshop with the people I'm talking with mm. later this afternoon, you know, you, you, you basically just look uh, where what one idea suggests another one or you, you're following your nose in a weird way, just seeing where this leads and you might say, well, now I'm going to do something similar to that or you might say something contrary, contrary to that. You might say, what can I do that's against what I just did? Something that's, that's you know, if it's a slow rhythm, maybe I'll do something with more a faster rhythm you know just contrast and you know so so just exploring um the little things those colors and 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 um as i say it's kind of wrote itself yeah da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah well that was a melody i came up with obviously to sing over those chords and hmm. i mean uh, yeah uh yeah it was also the song that somewhat controversially because you were very early adopter of uh taking one of your songs and putting it into a commercial uh, context. Not that early. <laughs> um, <laughs> well. we'd, we'd broken up at the time. We'd, you know, we'd, been, we'd, we'd been going... We'd, sorry. Well, uh, I'm talking about That's My Team. Yeah, That's My Team, the rugby so league. the rugby league thing. Mm. Big Sharks fan. Yeah, uh, yeah. And big rugby league fan. Yeah. And, so I've, I've um, slightly cooled on, on that a little bit. Fair uh, enough, yes. Uh, well, not on rugby league it's, itself, on sport. I'm kind of over it. Uh, okay. You know, particularly the pandemic has really rammed at home as far as the fact that, you know... Australian they were still able to play and no throwing all this money could. at sports and, yep. you know, and the arts got fuck all. Did. Fuck all. <laughs> um, I'm going to focus you back <laughs> on the fact that... Um, well, you know, let's be honest. You know, they, you know they, we, we had a thing. We were supposed to be playing a gig in Perth, uh, you know, at the end of last year. And we had to cancel it because, um, you know, they wouldn't let more than 500 people in an outside venue at that time. But they, at the same time, were letting 30,000 people go to see the uh, Fremantle Dockers play at a stadium. I mean, it's ridiculous. It was ridiculous. And that was WA government who were, you know, generally speaking, I think, did a good thing as far as being proactive about uh, COVID. But that was just ridiculous. Third time. It Sorry. was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I do want to take you back to that decision to right. use What's My Scene, yep. your biggest hit. Yep. And apply it to, uh, you know, in a, in a rugby yeah. league context and make, make, basically make it sort of a theme song for the do Sharks. Shall I do an apologetic now? You no. <laughs> no, I'm happy just, to explain. It's you know. very interesting, I think, because at the time it was certainly, you know, there was a sense of, oh, my God, what's he done with this song? I know. Uh, and it's now it's a rugby league song. And I hate rugby league. What have you done? <laughs> Dave Faulkner, explain yourself. Well, but, I will, as I said, an apologetic. But, but the commercial sense of it, you know, there has always been this tension between an artist's purity of essence yep. um, to maintain it, creative control, it has to be all about the song, yep. and then the commercial realities of going, well, hang on, why wouldn't I want to put that into a commercial environment where I can actually, you know, make a whole other, you know, stream of income from it and put it in a different place and give it another context. It was an interesting the, the decision. The latter is definitely a um, yeah. thing. Obviously, the money was, 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 was significant, so I'm not going to downplay that. Um, it wouldn't have happened without the money, I'll, I'll be honest. You know, um, If they wanted it for a favour, I would have said no. But, but um, you know, yes, I am a, was more then a rugby league fan. Um, and also, people would maybe be more aware of it in, in New South Wales and Queensland, but um, the campaigns for rugby league leading up to that period were quite high profile. It was a bit like, you know, they had Tina Turner doing Simply the Best, they had Tom Jones doing What a Man, What a Man, and, and um, you know, it was, it was kind of like this thing of almost like you've been asked to do a Bond theme song. <laughs> it was very high profile and, and, you know, and it was a very big business. And, you know, as you, as you said, everyone would, would hear about it. It wasn't like something that no one knows about. It really was very much in the public eye. And we knew that. Um, so one of the, I've got to be honest, one of the inducements for us was they did promise us very good seats to games <laughs> for the, the grand final in the state of origin. We got you know, flown up and put in the hotels and things like that. That was an in inducement, which at that time was, as I say, I was more of a fan and so I, that kind of was important. But um, what it had, the way it actually began, the, way, the whole thing, was a friend of mine um, who played rugby league 
Um, he's about 10 years younger than I am. Um, and we met as, a, you know, he's, he was playing for my team, the Sharks. And uh, he, but I was sitting next to him at, on the players bench one day, quite early on in my uh, being a fan of this team. And um, some, one of the players said, I recognise you, come and sit here and watch a game from here. So I sat there and this is, you know, times were a bit, a bit more simple then. It wasn't quite as uh, heavily controlled. Um, and, you know, he's, he was 21 and I was 31 and he, was, he started talking to me about music because he's a huge music fan. And so immediately we became, you know, a bit of a bond there and I sang at his wedding, things like that. Um, but he was on his way to, he was, he was retired as a player and he was working as an assistant coach and he was on his way to training uh, with the team he was working with. And uh, he's a bit of an ideas man, you know, this, this, uh, this ex-footy player. And um, he just had a, a great, you know, insight into changing the words of our song. And he, he's the one that came up with the lyric. That's my team. And he approached me and said, you know, I reckon it's be great for rugby league. You know, it's because, and, and I could hear what he was saying because as, as a fan of the game, some of the campaigns felt a little bit top down where they're sort of saying, it's so fantastic and awesome and you're going to love this experience. And, I'd, and then, um, uh, actually, I should tell another story in a second, if you don't mind, if I waste people's time. Um, 10.44, we've got 16 minutes. Okay, so, well... Yeah, I won't tell that story then. No, I do. Um, but anyway, so he, he, he was the one that started it and, uh, he, he, and I said, look, good luck. I'll tell you, here's a story. I'd actually, had written a song for my team. I'd written a song that, uh, and I went, and this is about five or eight years earlier, and I'd gone to see them, um, uh, to the, the marketing guy, and I, and I said, look, I've written this song. And, um, and he said, oh, no, no, we just licensed David Bowie's Heroes for the year and uh, you know that's you're kidding who do gurus i don't think so um oh, you know. so it was a vindication was it that well yeah in a weird way so it? so and i'd written this song and, and and uh and so i thought about a year went by and i thought you know that song is really good it's kind of like i thought it was a bit like a another song about like where i wipe out had a certain sort of catchiness to it and i sort of thought it was like crowd anthemic might work for this sort of you know thing um and i went in to see the nrl the headquarters and I spoke to another person there from marketing there, a much more important person, and he said to me, uh, when I played him the song and I explained it, he said, oh, that's really good, except the trouble is uh, it appeals to rugby league fans. And I, <laughs> I'm looking at him going, what? Yeah, right, yeah. He said, no, no, we, we, we're trying to appeal to the fans who won't go to see a rugby league game. The, the teenage girl in the, in the mall who might go see the latest Leonardo DiCaprio movie. We want her to go and see rugby league. We don't want, to, we don't want those rights of down fans to like it. So this is someone from marketing who thinks it's being incredibly intelligent and, uh, you know, they're so insightful. I'm going to grow the business by appealing to all the people that hate rugby league and everyone that likes rugby league, we don't care what they think. Right. And I just thought this is the biggest load of rubbish I've ever heard. But that was, that was, so I got short shrift and that was it. And so, as I say, several years later, right. um, L comes up and uh, I said, ah. well, good luck with that. Yeah, because <laughs> they don't think uh, anything I do would be relevant. But you had the song. And yeah, then so went, you yeah. know, and of course, we, but the thing is, the band had broken up. We'd been broken up for two years at that point. We um, we broke up in nineteen uh, ninety eight, uh, beginning of ninety eight. We we announced it in the end of ninety seven. Uh, ninety seven. We did a tour saying goodbye forever. Mm. Um, I was about to turn forty, and I was, um, you know. Th I'm, thinking that, um, you know, well, what, am, what else am I going to do with my life? I'm just going to be in one band forever. Well, here I am. But, <laughs> but um, uh, I just thought, you know, I've got to do something else. You know, it's a bit like, uh, you know, pretty much seven-year rich or whatever you want to call it, you know, midlife crisis. And um, so we broke up. And also you do get the um, strong, uh, you know, inference from other people, like the like those journalists or radio stations or the record industry business, that if you're old, you aren't relevant and that you were just cluttering up the way and you should actually clear the stage and let other artists through because you're just blocking them from, from appear, you know, which is, again, ridiculous, you know. The great thing about music, ladies and gentlemen, is that you cannot write too many songs. Mm. They don't occupy too much space in the universe. They actually only contribute to the benefits of, the, of society or the mm. world. And, you know, there's no landfill filled with old songs that have to be, you know, gotten rid of. Um, they get forgotten and they disappear naturally. But, you know, they, they, mm. there is um, always a need for new songs to express who we are, how we are, and this, this zeitgeist of right now. Even if you're writing about something completely different, like, you know, I'm writing about a song about medieval days and, you know, all knights and, 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 and uh, fair maidens, 
you will inadvertently somehow capture right now in that song because the very act of writing a song about something so far away from now in a way is a comment on now without you realising it because you're talking about values that don't exist anymore and people can see that in your song that there's, you know, it shows them something about now when they're hearing it. So the zeitgeist is always there in your song even if you don't think you're addressing it. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, so you get this feeling that, you you know, as an old person that you shouldn't be playing anymore and we thought, well, you know, what if we do get to the point where people don't want to see us perform and, and it's kind of embarrassing because, you know, we used to be, you know, up there and now we're down here and it's, isn't it sad what happened to them? You know, and, uh, you know, there were some bands I was kind of uh, a bit sort of feeling that about myself, you know, the, the people, that, a band that I loved was mental as anything and they'd kind of, you know, lost a lot of their cachet, but, you know, more power to that, that band. I mean, that, one of my favourite bands from Australia ever. Um, and, you know, the fact that they kept going, who's, who am I to say that they shouldn't hmm. play, a, you know, a show for, for, you know, down in Wollongong on a, on a Thursday night for 500 people if they want to, you know? Absolutely. But, um, you know, th- 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 so that's so basically I decided we, we'd quit while we were ahead. So that's what I did. And then, of course, um, you know, six years later, I came to my senses and realised that, you know, this was just ridiculous. Ridiculous. Let's mm. go and headline Meredith. Um, well, it was also I wrote some songs that, I, that yeah. I tried to play with other people. I didn't work. And, I, and, I, and there was one in particular I thought, this is a Hoodoo Guru song. And, mm. and um, it just seemed to be crying out for the Hoodoo Guru. So I kind of had to kind of accept it that the band was still there. That's your lot. Um, I'm, ta- I'm going to go 360 and sorry, sorry. go again back to the, um, you know, that decision, your commercial decision to oh, right. do the, the uh, that's, my, um, that's my team. Because, you know, it was your song to do with what you wanted. And often songwriting and songwriting credits within a band can, is, is the most critical tension point when it comes to division of royalties and who is recognised and sort of the division for songwriting royalties and mechanical royalties. And we've seen a number of bands where that's been a, a very uncomfortable... Yeah. Uh, Hunters and Collectors, certainly the early iteration of Crowded House. It was, you know, there have been a number of quite high-profile conversations around that. How have you, as the principal songwriter for the Gurus... I, I don't know how you oh, divvy it up, you. but I'm, it's I'm interesting. But sort of a band like Midnight Oil, for example, split the royalties. Do they? I don't know if they do. Oh, you know. You probably know. I mean, I'm not sure. Mm. Okay, maybe I don't. Yeah, no. Maybe I, I don't. I know, Let's not go there. I, I Let's ask ba- you about you. I know one yeah. band that did is REM. Yeah. They definitely split everything four ways. Yeah. So how did, what's been <coughs> your approach to that? And My ha- approach has been um, I believe I'm the songwriter and I get the royalties for the songwriting. Yeah. Um, there has been different things over the years where I've given um, a, a share of the, that income back to the, to the other members. Yeah. And in fact, on the new album, I, I um, contributed, I paid for um, mastering and uh, the new a, a video by myself and things like that. So I put significant money in. I, I actually got a, <laughs> a, um, a funny, a, a new usage of That's My Team, believe it or not, uh, was used for a campaign last year for Junior Rugby League. It wasn't on the major campaign for Rugby League, but it was just used as a recruiting thing for getting kids, mums to give their, their kids to play Rugby League uh, and juniors. And uh, so I got this money out of nowhere. And so I thought, well, that's kind of an arts grant, uh, given we've had this COVID and so I chucked a whole bunch of that money into the album, you know, basically to, um, you know, fund all this stuff. But, I mean, I, I don't apologise for, for that because, um, you know, in terms of, like, you know, saying that I deserve to have the songwriting royalties because it is my work and it's my, my passion, it's my talent. And, yes, the other people in the band are very important in, in delivering that and, and giving it voice, but they get their whole live career. I mean, the Hoodoo Gurus have been going now since 1981 um, you know, all my fellow members are in their 60s. Um, what other job can you have for life like that in the fly-by-night music industry? And that's true. Let's be honest. It is the songs that, that have kept us alive. I mean, um, that has been our, our whole uh, key. Um, you know, I know that's why I'm singing in the band. I mean, I'm not a good-looking guy. I'm not a great singer. Oh, come on, Dave. Um, but I'm there because I write these songs. And, and, and you know, I... I uh, and I work at it. I mean, yes, in some ways it comes easily for me. You know, that's my talent. Um, I'm the songwriter and that's what I do and why should the drummer not be as well recognised? But 
it just is, you know, because you can get another drummer or I could do it without a drummer. If, I had to, you know, if, if the band had have ended at any point, I wouldn't have stopped writing songs and performing and, and I'm sure I would have made a go of it. Um, not to sort of blow my, you know, my own trumpet, but it's just that's what, what I do and I was never going to do anything else. It's an interesting... I'm wrong about the oil, so strike that. Um, <laughs> it's interesting, though, that idea that a band is... That's my phone, my apologies. Um, that a band is sort of sometimes considered as greater than the sum of the parts. That without the band, yes, you're writing the amazing songs, but without that sort of live dynamic on stage and, and delivering the song... Oh, yeah, look. You know, that, that it may not land as well as you imagine it should... You know, so uh, it's an interesting tension. Yeah, well, totally. Point, I mean, as I say, it's a, it's a discussion, and you know, certainly, I you know, I don't say that no one should, you know, do if people shouldn't actually do what REM did. You know, it just depends on your circumstances. I mean, I do feel, um, yes, you know, to be stupid to deny the Hoodoo Gurus were a huge uh, vehicle for my songs. I think I already said that, but um, and you know, as I fully acknowledge, you know, the, the live success of the band is what got us success you know on radio we were basically on the nose for 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 australian industry when we signed up and people laughed at the hoodoo gurus being given a contract because it was so against the grain of what was considered to be commercial and popular and we've been like that pretty much ever since we've always been our own thing and you know fashions come and go but we're just who we are and um my songs are part of that but yeah, the band is obviously uh, important to um, deliver those songs and to, and to you know. But at the same time, you know, without the songs, I mean, I, it's very. The way I would describe it is, the Hoodoo Gurus are a sports car, and my songs are the fuel. That is delicious, um, and so we've we've kind of come right to the end of our conversation. This conversation could go on for some time. Yeah. Um, but there is a timelessness about the um, about your songwriting. You know, there's an you know. I remember seeing a show that you headlined at Meredith Music Festival. Right, um, yeah. great show. That, I remember that. That was an incredible show, and th- the thing that struck me about s- being in that environment was that none of the people up front, I wouldn't have thought, were alive no. when Stone Age <laughs> Romeos came out in 1984. True, probably. And there was something beautiful and euphoric about seeing a whole other generation know every single word to the Hooter Guru's back catalogue uh, and the new songs, but just having embraced the band with, with, with such a joyfulness and an enthusiasm. What does that feel like for you when you're performing and what do you think, um, you know, how do you sustain your place? Because that is the key, you know, as a, as a kind of a an artist now in your 60s, still sort of sustaining and finding that audience. You know, is there a... What's your, what's your kind of magic ethos for it? Uh, well, there's none really other than, the, as I say, and we, I would kind of obliquely refer to it by saying, you know, that we kind of ignored the waxing and waning of fashion. I mean, I don't... Anyone that tries to adopt what is happening right now and become like that to somehow, you know, find that way into, you know, success is not going to work. You can only succeed on being who you are. And you may, unfortunately, be one of these people that's going to be doing the sort of a genre of music that's never going to be, you know, uh, commercial. In, I use the word commercial not to describe the content of the music, but to describe the way the, the industry is. And we know what is played on radio now, and uh, most Australian artists don't fit into that genre. Um, you know, we're not sounding like, um, well, first, we don't come from overseas. That's a problem. <laughs> But secondly, we don't sound like some sort of, you know, um, you know, if we, uh, you're not going to sound like, a, you know, a commercial uh, R&B uh, production if you're playing a guitar. You know, that's so. If you if you do a certain certain sort of genres of music, automatically are disqualified from success, whether you like it or not. You know, if I was a classical musician, I would know. I might be able to get a booking on a in a concert hall once in a blue moon if I'm lucky, but I'm not going to get on Australian radio. Um, so you know, it, it, you. So you can't think of it like that. All you can do is the music that excites you and if you are lucky enough to find an avenue to exploit that music and to, to have it, you know, find its audience, then that's, an, you know, another thing really. I mean, uh, but it, the, the actual art of creating music and what it's, how you do it 
it can't be from any sort of you can't point it at a at a a, a goal you know you just got to write the song that's in front of you for the reasons that song wants to be which is you know it's saying something to you uh, about something that that concerns you yeah um i think i've slightly walked off the point no it's there. fine i i think i just wanted to you know that show that merit of the show was just incredible oh sorry um, um uh, the finding, we, you know staying you know i guess that, that it's the staying relevant sustaining the career you know it's it's sort of what has been that sort of key do you think that that's kept you going well i mean just another thing that i saw when i was in the punk rock days um ACDC were, were, were playing at that time and, uh, you know, they'd started you know, in the early 70s actually, about 73 I think it was. Um, and punk rock was 77 was when it was kind of when I was doing that, 77, 78. In 78 um, they were playing a concert at the Perth Concert Hall. I'm from Perth as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I decided to buy a ticket even though I wasn't a fan. I just thought I'd go see this, this band. I hear they're pretty good in concert. I don't know why for some reason. Really glad I went because it was an incredible concert. Um, but the thing that shocked me when I saw them was, I know a lot of their songs. I didn't know that before I walked in, but I did. And I think that's what people discover when they come and see us. I mean, whether these young fans who even know who the Hoodoo Gurus are, they might have heard our songs un- inadvertently as they're growing up or going about their business in the world. And that's the thing that often people hear. So we are, in the, we are definitely in the zeitgeist or whatever in the atmosphere of Australian culture, and that's something that I'm really proud of. Um, as far as... Uh, Longevity, um, there's a couple of things I want to say. One thing is, firstly, the Irving Berlin uh, quote, one of the greatest songwriters of all time. Um, He said, the lyrics make a song a hit, but the melody makes a song an evergreen. So that's one thing (laughs) that's worth considering. And secondly, in our case, because we haven't really ever been confined to any particular genre or era, you know, we haven't, you know, people, we've been indie, we mean, you know, people think of us as indie, people think of us as pop, people think of us as this, that and the other. But we're none of those things really, we're just us. And, you know, we, we happily draw on music from all sorts of genres ourselves. We have very broad tastes, all the members. And uh, that shows in the way we play things. And in a way, that's kind of made us less tied to any particular era. I mean, I'm... We play songs now from our first album and it doesn't sound like that's a song from so long ago. I mean, this morning I was having breakfast and I heard Madonna's Material Girl on the radio um, and I just thought, gee, she'll never play that song now because it sounds embarrassing for someone like her to sing that song. You know, she, she, she freely says that. She doesn't like her old songs. She won't do them in concert. She always wants to do the new songs and fine, you know, that's her, her choice. But just even listening to that song, I thought, you know, that song just sounds so quaint and kind of you know, it's a little bit banal and silly. Um, you know, it's still fun, you know, and that was what it was at the time, and it's still fun, but our songs still have something about us that's still what we are. You know, they, they represent us still. They're not songs that we are embarrassed by or they were part of our growing pains of being 17 or 19 years old, or in our case, 23. Um, you know, they still sound like hoodoo gurus and, you know, and other things don't sound like hoodoo gurus, so it must be, you know... So that's why they work still, I think. What's your favourite song to play live? Um, always the new songs. I mean, no, I know it's, it's boring to say it, but, you know, um, there's a song on the new album I really love um, called uh, Don't Try to Save My Soul. And I, um, it's kind of, it's a bit of uh, my ballad of John and Yoko, <laughs> in which people that love the Beatles would know that song. It's me telling a story about who I am and how I came to be right here right now um, and it expresses my some some of my considerable dilemmas in life in uh, you know love and romance and things like that which I'm still questioning and trying to figure out um, so the song kind of captures me and it's kind of a summation of you know me saying you know what I don't apologize I'm just here and it, I did what I could you know, but I did what I had to do is what the song says mm-hmm. and you know I'm still trying to figure it out but that song you know it's it's cool to be able to sing something that says you know a, a lot of what i'm about yeah COVID has smashed the live the live performance scene um streaming platforms of course have changed everything in terms of airplay and we've talked about that a little bit earlier uh around your decision to you know resurrect big time and 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 write for, write sort of singles based albums 
what what do you think has been the most significant change for you and how have you um, how have you kind of pivoted I guess Be- to sort because of, of COVID you mean well the whole you know just the COVID thing not being able to play live that changing that environment the impact of streaming platforms um, in terms of finding audience you know what what is how has that imp- you know what's been the sig- most significant change for you in in recent times um, and and I guess what you've observed for emerging artists, you know, what is yeah. it? What is it doing at the moment for where we're at? Well, I won't speak so much for me personally because we are what we are, and we're, you know, we've got that reputation, and we can book a tour and do gigs and probably get an audience. So we, you know, we're kind of a little bit, you know, bulletproof in that sense, business-wise. Um, but for everyone else in the whole world, obviously, it's been a terrible time, and you know, not just music. Obviously, you know, it's been dreadful, and unfortunately, we have the fear of another pandemic right in, in front of us already. I mean, COVID hasn't gone away. HIV, AIDS is still here. There's another pandemic that hasn't, you know, been settled yet. Um, but the monkeypox, I'm sorry, but this could be just as significant as uh, COVID and uh, could be could impact us just as heavily. Um, I hope not. But as far as practically speaking, one thing that, you know, to give the change that's been most profound for all of us, you know, regardless of, you know, COVID and all that other crap, is obviously the internet, streaming, yes, all these things. We know the world has changed. It's a mass uh, media world now, communications. You no more have to worry about being an old coot in, in Wangaratta that no one wants to know about playing your classical music or your folk, you know, from, you know, on, on the zither. You can be doing that and you can find an audience using the internet. Just got to, you know, obviously figure out your way through and, you know, put your, upload your music to, to, you know, to Bandcamp or whatever and, you know, get, get onto blogs, whatever. Don't pay money if you can avoid it. I know there's a lot of people who make money out of exploiting artists who want to get, you know, sh- showcased. Um, I, I feel for you in that regard. Um, but, you know, just meet friends and like, like-minded souls and collaborate across the world. Uh, that's the one thing you can do. And you don't have to be, you know, a young, hip thing to doing the latest sounds to actually do that. Anyone can do it all the time. So that's the one thing that has changed. I mean, I grew up in Perth, as I mentioned, and, you know, we felt like that Nullarbor plane was a, an absolute insurmountable obstacle to us. And, of course, the record industry didn't want to know about us over there. You had to come to Sydney or Melbourne to show your wares and to be taken seriously as a band. And that's why I moved to Sydney as a, as a young man, um, one of the reasons. But now you don't have to do that. You know, we've seen the John Butlers, you know, and people like that who make an incredible career out of, uh, you know, being based in the southwest of WA, you know, in the country. And it doesn't matter where you live and what you're playing, you can find an audience. So just do what you do best. Write your damn songs. Write them the best way you know how about things that matter to you. Don't write them for other people that are going to hear them. Obviously, they will tell you what ones they like and you have to take that on board. But... You know, as far as why you write them in the first place, that's only you and your, your, and your muse, whatever, the thing that's exciting you at that moment. And that's um, something that if, it's, if you capture something real and, 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 you know, something that's got an essence of you in it and also, you know, is, is your love of music and beauty and all those things, then that may communicate to someone else and you may find an audience for that. So, um, you know, that there is no reason to despair because of the world being shut down around us for any reason because we, we just have, you know, we're a computer terminal away from everyone else in the world. And what keeps it fun for you? What, what keeps, it, keeps you interested in, in, in being the lead singer and principal songwriter for the Huda Gurus? Well, I mean, the Huda Gurus are probably winding up in, you know, not too distant future. I mean, it's just, you know, we don't want to be a parody of ourselves or get to the point where we can't perform to the level we demand of ourselves because we really are proud of the show we put on and we always have we, we're very high energy and and you know no compromise and, and and i'm still able to sing you can if i mean i'll happily say the new album i'm hitting all the same notes i could ever hit doesn't sound like a, a, a you know a fatigued voice or a voice that's aged out of the range unfortunately we've heard paul mccartney's voice has kind of lost a lot of um you know ability i mean he's still I'm glad it's, he's still singing and performing but it's not quite the same um so I don't want to be the Hudu Gurus doing that, where I can't sing the songs the way I expect. You know, I have to, and the same with the rest of us. So that's that's by, that's irrelevant, really. The fact is, I still do music. I love music, and I can't stop. Um, that's why I 
became a musician, as I explained. You know, I, I did it without knowing that's what I was going to be. I know that now I am a musician. Even if I choose to be something else, I'll still be a musician. And, I, you know, it's, it's a part of my brain that never switches off, um, it's, it's, which is a blessing, absolute, you know, fantastic thing that, um, you know, I, I, at one stage I was getting um, uh, air sickness for a while and, and get, or not, I was getting phobia, phobia about flying. And the way I detuned my brain from being freaking out was by having headphones and listening to music whenever I flew. And half my brain would be distracted. So, like, that's just who I am. And, and I'm sure you have the same experience where, you know, if there's a radio playing in a restaurant, you're talking to people and you're hearing everything, but at the same time you know exactly what song is playing and you can, t- <laughs> you, know, you, can you remember a whole lot of things about that music, which you're not even paying attention to. It's just only when you kind of, in a sense, switch your attention, you can, you can say, oh, I was listening to that, wasn't I? You know, it's just something we do as musicians. We are aware of a, another, re- another dimension to the world that we are very lucky to be ac- have access to. It's a great opening lyric for a song, Dave Faulkner. I spent half my life in airports, <laughs> a thousand miles away. Um, friends, please thank the extraordinary Dave Faulkner for a beautiful conversation. Thank you. Thank you to APRA for having us here and this incredible venue. And um, you're doing a, a songwriter session this two, afternoon? I'm doing two, the panels yep. this af- uh, two this afternoon, yes. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. And thank I'll be you. masking up, sorry about that, but I just, I'm just very phobic of, of uh, COVID, so I will be masking. Yes, same. Um, hey, thanks so much for listening. I hope it's been enjoyable and Dave will be around to buttonhole for other conversation, other questions that I didn't ask because I'm sure there's thousands. <laughs> Hard to kind of try and navigate a conversation in and out. Word in. Sorry about that. <laughs> to, um, to capture a 41-year career. But thanks again, Dave Faulkner. Great Thank to you, chat. Tracy. Tracy Hutchison, ladies and gentlemen. Dave Faulkner, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. <laughs>